Hello everyone and thank you for joining us on the Sabbath School panel as we discuss the lesson quarterly entitled Stewards in the Last Days. This is a very deep and timely message. We will be discussing what our focus should be in these final days as we rapidly approach Christ's second coming and how to prepare others and ourselves. This week on the panel we have Adrian Fanaru, Karina Espinal, and myself, Emma Turoyu. Today we are studying Lesson 7, Treasure in Heaven. If you would like to study along with us, you can find a digital copy by visiting sdrm.org publications. There you can find the lesson in over 30 languages as well as previous quarterlies. Before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to study together and we ask that you will bless us and also bless those that are listening. Help us to um, love to study deeper into your word and that we may be able to um, further your soon coming. And also, please forgive us of all our sins and shortcomings and help us to um, outpour your love to others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. In preparation for this week's important subject, we will have a quick review on what we discussed in last week's lesson, The Love of Money, led by Karina. Thank you. So we're going to, we're going to be reviewing um, Lesson 6, which is found on page 31, and it's titled The Love of Money. And I think um, Brother Frenaru last week brought up a really good question. He asked, do we like money or do we love money? Hmm. And I think it's an important question because I don't, money itself is necessarily not a bad thing, right? We actually need money in this, these days to survive. If we want a house, we need to have money to be able to purchase a house. If we want clothes, we need money to have clothes. So essentially money is payment and it's good to have it. But when it comes to loving money, that's when things can become a little dangerous and detrimental to us mm -hmm. as, as uh, Christians in, in our spiritual walk. And another point is that money, the money that we have, when we, start to love it, it's wrong because it's not even our money to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. Everything belongs to the Lord. And he reminds us of that in the memory text. If we look at Haggai 2 verse 8, it says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. So we see here that God is asserting his sovereignty and title to the earth's resources as their creator and owner of all that there is. So like I mentioned that us as humans, we're not the true owners of the, these resources of the earth, but we hold all of these things under the grace of God. And if we look right under the memory text, it says, In all our expenditure of means, we are to strive to fulfill the purpose of Him who is the Alpha and Omega of all Christian effort. So the word expenditure, it means the action of spending. So in anything that we do and anything that we purchase, we have to honor and glorify the Lord because it's His money. And also, things that we do with this money, it shows where our priorities lie, which leads us mm. to Sunday, which is titled Hearts Revealed. And it asks the question, how does our use of money reveal the depth of our consecration to God? And we see that the answer is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Would you like to read that? Sure. I mean, it says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we can, you know, when you look at people, you kind of know them by the way that they spend their money. So people who spend it on cars and a lot of houses and materialistic things, you can see that they value the material aspect of life. But when you see people who spend a lot of their money helping others in charities and missions, you can see that their heart is with people and helping others. And it's kind of like, you know, in the same way that people tell you who your friends are, that's how I'll know you by. But it's the same thing with the way we spend our money and, you know, how we manage our finances. Um, I, I meditated on the question I asked last Sabbath, uh, whether we love money or like money. Uh, because believe it or not, it just came out, right? I, I didn't really deeply consider it before asking the question. So I took some time to meditate uh, about the, on the difference between loving the money and liking money. Mm -hmm. And I came to the conclusion that when you love the money, because we have to examine ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. How do we know whether we love the money or like the money? Because it looks like there is a very fine line between the two. And uh, I thought that the best way to figure it out is if the money, if money is your goal, mm -hmm. is love for money. 
if money is means by which you take care of yourself, your family and others, then you like to have money because of the different purposes you have for the money. And um, it's, um, I think we have to examine ourselves in the light of, of, um, of that and find out whether the money we earn is the goal which, which usually leads people to sacrificing everything for money. They sacrifice friendships, they sacrifice their own body, they sacrifice their family just so they can get more money. Mm -hmm. That's the, the end goal is to have money. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed is that people who get some money and make of the money their goal, they spend it very easily. Mm. They spend it very fast. Mm. And I remember I had the privilege of knowing the richest person in Hungary. He came to our one of our conferences. He was invited. You looked at him, you wouldn't say he was the richest man in Hungary. He looked like one of us, <laughs> like somebody who didn't have money. Mm. Uh, because he thought that buying more than what you need for yourself was defeating the purpose of having money. Mm. He preferred to invest in others. Mm. And he proved so because, you know, I, I saw him giving a lot of money away, right? And it was interesting. He, he seemed so simple. And you realize that he is the richest man. People who who get to having an amount of money, love the money, and they spend it very easily. Um, I, I, I saw it so many times, like it was mentioned, you know, you see people driving these beautiful cars, you know, it, it's not because they have a lot of money, it's because they want to show they have money, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, I hope we are not falling in that trap. Yeah, absolutely. I was reading up on this story of this professor at Harvard. He did a study, like a survey, and he asked people that made like an average amount of money, and he asked on the other spectrum, like people that made millions of dollars, and he would ask them, he's like, on a scale of zero being so depressed and like not happy at all to 10 being extremely happy, how happy are you? And people would say like, oh, I'm at a seven or I'm at an eight or I'm at a six. And then he said, okay, However happy you are now, think of how much money you have in your bank account. And then he says, does your level of happiness change? Does it make mm -hmm. you more happy or does it make you less happy? And he said that like everyone he asked, they said that they became less happy thinking of their bank account and they wished they had more money. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that that's bad because if you associate your level of happiness by the amount of money you have, you will never be truly happy because you will always want more money. Like they said, mm -hmm. they're like, we wish we had more money. So if you always wish you had more money, you will never reach that level, true level of happiness. Mm -hmm. So that's, I also think um, how, with, if love is attached to money, that can also be detrimental and also be, have a negative effect on us. But looking back to our priorities and what, you know, what we do with our money, in Matthew 6, it's actually continuing, um, it's actually coming right after Matthew chapter 5, which is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And he's teaching that God cares about our thoughts and our feelings, which is why this is so important. Because like you mentioned, Emma, if our priorities are on earthly things, that's, you know, our actions will show that. Mm -hmm. But here God is telling us to, you know, store our treasures up in heaven. So if we stockpile, you know, in, invest in earthly and heavenly things, that's eventually where we will end up when Jesus comes. And in the... Let's the last sentence, no, the last two sentences under 1A, it says, we should consecrate our property. The language of our hearts would be, Lord, here is the means which thou hast made me responsible. What wilt thou have me to do with it? Hmm. So that's a question that we should constantly continue to ask ourselves because like the sentence after that, it says, money is a trust from God. So he's trusting us with his resources and we are his stewards, which is what we've been talking about for this quarter. So we should constantly ask, Lord, what will you have me to do with this money that you've you know, that you've let, made me a steward of. And question B, it gives us an example of, you know, one of the people in the Bible who did exactly that. 
David said in Chronicles, he said, I have set my affection to the house of my God. So he set his mind, his everything, his resources on heavenly things. And, you know, we should ask ourselves, can we do the same or have we done the same? Um, the last two sentences under 1b says, we are reaping the fruits of this infinite self-sacrifice. And yet, when labor is to be done, when our money is wanted to aid the work of the Redeemer and the salvation of souls, we shrink from duty and pray to be excused. Mm-hmm. So instead of that, like we mentioned in 1a, we should continually, or we should strive to ask, what will Lord, what will you have me to do with this money? Mm-hmm. So if no one else has anything to say, we can move on to Monday which is being aware of the enemy's plan. And we learn the answers in that through this story, which is a parable in Matthew 20. Do you, does anyone know who Jesus was talking to in Matthew 20? He was, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that he was talking to his disciples and he was explaining to them how if you, you know, if you work hard that, and if you sacrifice and you dedicate your life to serving Christ, you will be rewarded and your reward will be heaven. But he was saying, and he mentioned the famous phrase, um, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, which leads us to Matthew 20 in the story how this man, he went out and hired several workers to work for him at different part- times of the day. And at the end of the day, everyone got paid the same. And mm-hmm. the people that worked in the morning, were they were frustrated. They're like, we worked so much longer than mm-hmm. these people. Why aren't we getting paid more? And he's talking to the disciples, which means that you know, as Christians, this can be applied to us, which means that as Christians, sometimes we're guilty of becoming entitled because yeah. we think that we're Christians, we're guaranteed heaven, or because we did something good that we should have a reward for or receive recognition. But that's exactly what Satan wants. So the two key words here that we should be aware of constantly is selfishness and covetousness. Mm-hmm. And envy. Mm-hmm. Because this example given here has to do with, a lot with envy because um, selfishness, covetousness means you want everything for yourself. Mm. But then envy is when somebody else gets it too, right? That's You are envious mm. of somebody receiving the same amount of money like you do. Mm. Um, and, and this is a problem. Uh, and, and this covetousness and selfishness always leads to express envy in relationship with others. So in this example, it wasn't about how much one earns. Mm -hmm. It's about why somebody else earns as Mm -hmm. much as I do, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, When when they sign the contract for so much, right? The person who signed the contract, who was hired, was happy with the pay, right? When did that person turn sour? when somebody else received the same pay, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Which was not coming out of his pocket. Mm -hmm. It was coming out of his Lord's pocket. Mm -hmm. So if you are happy with your pay, why would you be unhappy with somebody else's pay? Well, because they, yeah, yeah. for them, they didn't have to do as much work as you to get it. Like I've seen where someone will get a car and then another person will get a car as a gift. And then the other person will be upset because they had to work so hard for this car, but this other person just got it. So I think, yeah, exactly. Maybe we're not so much envious of what they have, but the way that they got it and how maybe easier they got it than we did. And the Lord tells us that, you know, our reaction to something that also, which we just talked about on Sunday, our are where our hearts are that you know that will come out in our reaction to things Mm -hmm. and the lord tells us in inspiration the second paragraph the first sentence under 2a says the lord desires us to rest in him without a question as to our measure of reward Mm -hmm. and that's where our human nature comes in where we tend to compare ourselves to others and compare and say like hey why why are they getting what we got like Mm -hmm. we deserve more which is where the covetousness and envy like you mentioned comes in And if we continue reading a couple sentences further down, it says, God desires us to appreciate his promised blessings, but he would not have us eager for rewards, nor feel that for every duty we must receive compensation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it says, love to God, last sentence, love to God and to our fellow men should be our motive. Mm -hmm. I think it was, you know, what stood out to me is how it said, you know, we shouldn't, 
always be feeling that we have to get a reward for every you mm -hmm. know for everything and it like makes you think of a child when you teach them to do good thing like you know when I was younger my mom would say all right if you behave or if you do this I'll give you something when you get home <laughs> and so then I would get home and I would get it but I would want another one and I would like always think of ways you know how can I get more cookies or whatever it was but um you know and I think even further in the lesson it talks about how as Christians the reward shouldn't be the first thing on our mind when we do good things or when we, you know, are are fulfilling our Christian duty. And I just, you know, I thought it was so applicable because even as a child, you can, you know, you see that. And um, it's, I guess, so important that we have to, you know, not feel entitled, pretty much mm -hmm. like you were saying. Mm -hmm. there, there is no better reward than seeing the result of the work you volunteer for. Mm -hmm. rather than the result of the work you are hired for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can see the difference between workers who, in, in any aspect of life, right? Workers who have volunteered to do the job they, they, they were projecting for, and those who haven't practiced at all and they started only when they had the salary, right? Mm -hmm. You can see the difference. And um, th this is why when students volunteer, they earn credits, mm -hmm. because volunteering is very much appreciated in, in any profession, right? So because if you volunteer and work for free, people know that's your calling. You treat that job as your calling. Those who do not volunteer and only work when they are, get paid, they just look at it as a, as a rewarding experience, financial rewarding experience, not moral and you know, mm -hmm. satisfying to the soul. And um, in, in God's work, should be the same, right? Um, I'd rather see working for the Lord a person who volunteers and has that drive towards missionary work than a person who just sat in class in a missionary school, who never did anything, just sat in class, mm -hmm. passed the tests, and now expects to be hired in the work, mm -hmm. right? I'd rather have the person who, who maybe struggled a little bit in the missionary school, but has that desire mm -hmm. to share with others. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think volunteering, like Isaiah, when, when Isaiah decided to work for the Lord, the Lord didn't call him by name. Mm. He said, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, I will. He volunteered, right? Mm -hmm. And when you do volunteer, you know it's, it's God calling you and not the church or somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. Because you worked before somebody else called you, right? Mm -hmm. Before the church hired you, you were already a worker because of the calling received from God. Yeah. And I feel like when you volunteer, it shows like an honest and genuine motive mm -hmm. as opposed to doing things for the wrong reasons, doing it for the money or for mm -hmm. the salary or for a paycheck, um, which when you do it for the right motives, when you volunteer, when you sacrifice yourself for the Lord, that shows that you have no selfishness and no, and no covetousness, which is exactly what the Lord is looking for. So if no one else has anything to mention, we will move on to Tuesday, which is titled A Serious Matter. And this kind of ties into Sunday's lesson, and it asks the question, how does the love of money deteriorate our spiritual life, and what is the cure for it? So we see that in 1 Timothy 6, 9, and 10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. And we hear this passage a lot, and, you know, as time goes on, I, I've heard it a little differently. Some people tend to take out some of the words and say, oh, money is the root of evil, and, you know, money, like we talked about, money is not the problem. If we read the verse, it says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Mm -hmm. So why is this such a serious matter? Because when we start to love money, like we've talked about, we develop, we develop selfishness, we develop covetousness, and we develop greed, cruelty, sometimes even extortion, sometimes even self-seeking. Mm -hmm. self mm -hmm. So those who put money above all else, they, you know, you, normally that can end in disaster. Mm -hmm. And when money becomes more important than God and other people, it becomes a problem mm -hmm. because it becomes an idol. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And as we know, we can only serve one master. Yeah, you know, like you were mentioning about extortion. I mean, that's so common nowadays. You have people who are, you know, laundering money or, you know, drug dealing or, you know, even human trafficking. They use that now as a profit and so many other things. And, you know, it just shows us how heinous the love of money can, you know, what heinous actions it can cause us to do. And, you know, the rest of the verse says the rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many hurtful lusts. So once you just get a little bit, you know, it's like a kick. It just, you just can't stop. And we see, you know, so many people who, um, you know, you can read plenty of stories, people who, you know, maybe they started working in the drug business because maybe they had like a health condition or something and they just wanted to be able to pay for their health care. And then by the end of it, you know, they're laundering money, running from mm-hmm. these people and it's, you know, they're struggling. And so it's, you know, I think that it's important to to stress the fact that um, this is what the love of money makes you do. If you don't love money, you you would never go uh, through such such extents and and such circumstances. And you know, throughout the Bible, we see how much pain and suffering was brought to people who loved money, and and they stole or lied or you know, etc. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I think it's important, like you mentioned, that it's not money itself that's the problem, but it's people who end up loving it end up doing unethical things to obtain money and to continue to obtain money, which I think is important. So we've talked about how the love of money is the root of, and it says all evil, which is amazing because there's a lot of different kinds of evil, but the root of money is, or the love of money is the root of all evil. So we know that, but you know, the Lord gives us a solution. And we can find that in, you know, in the, in the passage right underneath the question. The second sentence says, constant self-denying benevolence is God's remedy for the cankering of, cankering sins of selfishness and covetousness. So, like you said, like volunteering, doing things, being selfless and continue giving starts covetousness to sin. So doing things, giving away, that is God's remedy for, you know, feelings of selfishness and covetousness. I was reading this story about this author who, um, she was a Christian author and she wrote this book and it was titled, you know, Spiritual Journey, something like Spiritual Journey to a More Generous Life. And this ended up, this book ended up becoming super popular, became a bestseller. So the NBC News Channel, they invited them on um, for to do a live interview. So the author goes on and does the interview and the person interviewing the author, they ask the question, they're like, so do you think God wants everyone to be rich? And the author's like, no, I, that's not what I'm saying. And the interviewer was like, well, what do you mean? You just wrote this book on how everyone can be, like have a generous life. Like, don't you want everyone to be, to be rich? And the author said, No, they said, I believe that everyone needs to learn to become more generous with whatever God has given them. So then the interviewer said, well, you just wrote this book and it became super popular. And with this money, you've basically become rich. And the author said, no, it helped me to become even more generous. Mm -hmm. So it's important for each of us to remember that with everything that we have, with all the money, whether we're super rich or not as rich, to become generous with it mm-hmm. and to become giving and which is what the Lord wants us to do with it. It's- yeah. And like just going off what you said, how he said it made him more generous. Mm-hmm. Um, it Like the note talks about how, um, you know, if we continually give, then it'll starve covetousness to death. So even though he has a lot of money, he can be more generous because mm-hmm. he's, you know, continually mm-hmm. giving and um you know, I think this ties in with systematic benevolence and how, um, you know, when we're constantly giving, we don't form attachments to the things that we have already. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then we start to think, well, do I really need to give this much right now? Or maybe I'll keep this for myself or, you know, use this money here. But, yeah. yeah. So, so many people promise to give because they did not expect to make so much money. Hmm. Right. When, when they say I'll give a percentage of um, what I will make, they do that not expecting how much money they will make. When they do make a lot of money, 
they tend to change their minds and say, oh, wait a minute, you know. Mm-hmm. Like uh, uh, Anana and Safira, yeah. Safira, or Safira mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They, they said, we will give everything. And then when they saw how much that was, mm. they said, you know, even if we keep half for, our, for ourselves, the other half is going to be maybe as much as we expected to sell the property for, mm-hmm. right? So it, it doesn't make a difference because we mm-hmm. made extra, we keep the extra that mm-hmm. we made. But mm-hmm. the promise was we will give all, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and this is why it's important to notice that constant giving mm-hmm. is, is a remedy to covetousness. Because if you say, oh, I will not give it this month, I will wait for next month, it, it, the, the, the amount becomes bigger and bigger, mm-hmm. right? And it will actually appeal to covetousness rather than healing covetousness, right? Mm-hmm. Because you say, oh, wait a minute, this is too much. But if you give a little bit every month, it's going to help you mm-hmm. always systematically mm-hmm. um, uh, s- 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 deny yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Systematically deny yourself. And that becomes a habit. And habits form characters, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's actually a good segue to Wednesday. But before that, um, we'll quickly go over question B, where it says, where does God want us to focus our attention and why? Um, he wants us to focus, you know, our attention on heavenly things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like we've talked about, it talks about how all things belong to God, everything that we have. And, you know, I think it's interesting that the Lord, He, he doesn't even need our help. He just does this because He wants us to learn mm-hmm. these qualities so that we can prepare ourselves to be selfless and to be able to survive in heaven which I think is beautiful. Um, It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So that's that's where we should hopefully end up, you know, that should be our goal to, you know, be sit sit next to Christ in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go into Wednesday's lesson, which is a covenant by sacrifice. And we've kind of touched upon this briefly, but it's talking about how people, when they have possession of wealth, it becomes harder to give. Mm. So they have this idea where they say that they're going to wait until they've passed and then leave their money in a will, which that might seem like a good idea, but like we've talked about, we talked about how it's hard to constantly give because that that takes sacrifice. Mm. And when you leave things at the end, when you've already gone, I mean that's easy because it's no longer yours because you're not long, you're no longer here to enjoy mm-hmm. it. So that's not what God wants. Um, it says the first sentence under four a says, "With many, the possession of wealth has proved a snare. In their desire to follow the fashions of the world, they have lost their zeal for the truth, and they're in peril of losing eternal life." Which is scary that we love money so much that we are in danger of losing eternal life because we'd rather enjoy the possessions here on earth. Mm-hmm. But that's not what God wants. He wants us to practice a continual giving and continual self-sacrifice. Um, I'm looking at the first, no, the second sentence in the last paragraph under 4a says, He did not withhold his own life from them, but for their sakes became poor, that through his poverty they might be made rich. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just absolutely beautiful that he lowered himself so that we could rise. And it's important for us to learn how to do the same, whether that's, you know, con- continual giving or finding ways to serve others, if it, even if it's not money, but just finding ways to sacrifice yourself for the Lord in every aspect of your life. And if you wait till the end of your life, I mean, I've seen, you know, legal cases where um, mm. someone will write a, a will and they'll forget to sign one thing mm. and they can't release any of the money. So the money will either go to the state or whatever, but it can't go to the purpose that the person originally intended. So even with, you know, setting a will for yourself, you don't know if your money's actually going to go where you intend for it to go to. And that's why I think, you know, this lesson stresses so much how give in your lifetime, give for today, you know, because that's all we're promised. And, you know, if, if you make plans for the future, for your will, you don't know what's going to happen and, you know, if that's actually going to be sustainable. But... And then the, the satisfaction you have to see the work progress in your lifetime, 
um, it, it's you, you can't measure that mm-hmm. joy, right? To see to see a person surviving a scare or an accident, you see a church being built. Uh, it, it helps you in your relationship with God and with mm-hmm. others. Absolutely. Yeah, and B brings up another issue that some people face, especially this is for the parents, is talking about how when you, instead of giving or donating your money to the Lord's work, you end up giving it to your kids that sometimes, you know, in some situations they're not in the faith. So the Lord requires, you know, full full self-sacrifice. And sometimes people try to do half and half, which ends mm-hmm. up being lukewarm, which we know that the Lord does not approve of that either. So the second sentence under 4b says, by doing so, they lay off that responsibility which God has laid upon them and place in the enemy's ranks, means which God has entrusted them, to be returned to him by being invested in his cause when he shall require it, require it of them. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing to remember. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's, it, it's, it's, it's easier said than done. We talk about it and it's hard to apply it, but... It's something like it says, the Lord has entrusted us with his funds. So it's, and he gives us time to be able to master these, these abilities, which shows um, that God is merciful as well. So if no one else has anything to say about Wednesday, we will go into Thursday, which is the safest deposit box. And I was thinking about this, like we've been talking about laying up our treasures in heaven, laying up our treasures in heaven. But what is that? What does that mean? Does that mean that we're storing things in heaven, so when we get there, we'll be rich. What so, does it mean to store up our treasures in, in heaven, in the safest deposit box? Mm. Well, it, it actually means to invest in the spiritual things. Uh, invest in things that you are not going to enjoy only in this life, but in the life to come. Uh, invest in saving souls for eternity. Mm. That's what it means to invest in heaven because in heaven everybody will be rich we will step on gold right Um, it's it's not so we can take or be repaid in heaven it is so we can lead as many lives to christ as possible Uh, that's what i believe seeing god's work progress seeing uh, the work going to new countries giving others an opportunity to know the truth like we do. Amen. That's beautiful. And in questions A and B, it shows us that the Lord is there to help us through this. He says that, you know, consider the lilies of the field. If he takes care of them, us as humans, you know, shall God not much more clothe you? Like the verse says, it says, O ye of little faith. And it also says to seek ye first the kingdom of God. So it says when we do that, when we seek after Christ and when we do our our part, it says, you know, everything shall be added. So it shows us that the Lord is with us and that he will add on to our lives and complete everything that we need in our life, however that may look like. The last sentence says under 4a, every act of self-sacrifice for the good of others will strengthen the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart, allying him more closely to the redeemer of the world. And then it ends with the question, what is the most fruitful way to preserve our wealth? So how do we keep all this wealth that we've finally been able to, to you know, acquire? And the first, ver- the first word of, this, of the verse says honor. And I think mm-hmm. that's, you know, that kind of sums it all up really nicely. It says honor the Lord with everything that we have. And, you know, and when in doing so, we will end up laying our treasure up in the bank of heaven. Mm-hmm. Amen. Thank you, Karina. We will now begin studying this week's lesson entitled Treasure in Heaven, led by Brother Adrian. Well, um, it's amazing uh, to transition into a subject which is um, the opposite of what we've studied in the review lesson. Um, We've studied a lot about selfishness, about love of money, So now we are going to actually expand on what we just mentioned, which is what does it mean to have treasures in heaven? Mm -hmm. And we we mentioned the fact that we invest in God's work, we invest in seeing other souls 
um, experience salvation, get to know the truth, invest in literature, invest in poor countries, actually pay for your trip to go to a country where you can be of help. Um, countries that lack education, you can be an educator, you can be a teacher. Uh, in countries where they lack medical assistance, you can be a doctor, you can be an assistant. So whatever you do, you can be a missionary. Just think about this. When you meditate on what profession you want to choose, make sure that before the title that you are going to have, you can add the word missionary. So instead of just a doctor, you are a missionary doctor. You are a, uh, you are a missionary builder. You are right. Mm -hmm. So if you cannot have the word missionary in front of the profession you are going to have, uh, it's probably not for you as a Christian, mm -hmm. right? So make sure what you do is going to be related to God's work, right? Because God is not asking us to give our money only or our means. He is actually expecting us, not forcing us, expecting us, as we experience His love, to also offer ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Our time and our um, efforts. The memory text, uh, would you like to read it, Emma? Sure. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now we keep repeating this verse, right? This <laughs> last part. Where your treasure is, mm -hmm. your heart will be also. Just think for a moment, right? When you spend your money, when you spend your uh, time into something, ask yourself whether you would like your heart to be there, mm -hmm. whether you, you would like your life to end right there, making that investment. Mm -hmm. Would that be satisfying? Will, will that give you the assurance that you will actually be saved? Will it give you, uh, does it give you the assurance that you are actually investing in someone else's life and uh, spiritual enrichment. Uh, Karina, can you read uh, uh, Christ Object Lesson, page 374, please? Sure. God desires us to choose the heavenly in place of the earthly. He opens before us the possibilities of a heavenly investment. He would give encouragement to our loftiest aims, security to our choicest treasure. Thank you so much. Let's go into the sun Sunday lesson, the result of gratitude. Mm. What vital expression should repeatedly resonate in our hearts? Well, the verses pretty much that keep uh, repeating themselves in the Psalms say, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for wonderful works to the children mm. of men. And, you know, in verse 8, it says this in verse 15 and 21 and 31. So it keeps mm -hmm. repeating every few verses. And I think that this is David trying to reiterate this idea of gratitude to us that, um, you know, there's goodness in everywhere we look. You don't have to look very far to see, you know, just being able to breathe fresh air or go outside or even walk. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, something to be so grateful for. I, I, I'm trying to imagine how David was writing these psalms, or somebody else was writing, but what I imagine, it, it's like his life was a song. Mm -hmm. uh, in whatever he was involved in, he would make a song out of it. And I'm saying this because not only did he compose songs when he was happy, he was also writing songs or composing songs when he was sad. Mm -hmm. Because you, you see many differences in his life, right? But it's interesting that at the end of it, he was either saying God was right or saying praise the Lord. It happened that way. Mm -hmm. And I learned that Either in, in happy moments or in tribulation, you should still praise the Lord. Mm. 
And when, when you meditate on David's life, he went through a lot, right? But he wrote a lot or composed a lot of songs. How is our life? Is our life a song? You know, when I notice that when I'm happy, there is always a song in the back of my head, mm -hmm. right? I'm not singing it, I'm not a good singer, but there is a song there, you know? I, I sing it in my mind where nobody can judge me, right? <laughs> By the way I sing. Mm -hmm. But I have it in my mind and I keep repeating it. I remember when I, when I first started coming to church, I learned a few songs by heart. And I remember, like it were yesterday, there were 11 songs that I knew by memory. Hmm. And I would sing all of them in the order I had learned them. Hmm. Right? I would know the order. There was one song that I would sing more because it, it, was, it, it had more to do with my experience. My, my, the, the experience of my conversion. And actually, because I was singing it all the time, I believe that had an effect on my mom. Mm. Because she was not coming to church, she was actually you know, trying to uh, discourage me from pursuing um, a religious life. And uh, when I, I, I ended up leaving home because, you know, because of the struggle there was in the family. I ended up leaving home, I went canvassing, and then every three months I would come back to visit. And one day I came back, it was in the evening, I was in my bedroom, and I heard somebody sing my favorite song. And I knew there couldn't be anybody else but me singing the song because there was nobody else religious in the family. So I thought, I'm probably hearing it in the back mm. of my head, but I was hearing somebody else's voice, not mine, mm. right? So I said, mm, wait a minute, you know, I, I became curious. I went out of my bedroom and, and I went towards where I was hearing the voice uh, singing from. And I realized it was my mom in mm. her bedroom singing my song. Mm. You know, I sat down by the door and I started crying and praying and thanking the Lord. And even though I was not a good singer, just the fact that I was happy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, she, she testified later that she was feeling guilty, that she was fighting against a, a positive impulse I was feeling. And I had given up on so many things and, and she felt rebuked and said, how can I, you know, at my age an adult, not have the strength that this young man has mm. to give up on everything and dedicate his life to God. My mom ended up getting baptized before I did. Wow. You know, wow. it was the, the same day, but she was the first one going into mm -hmm. the water, you know. And that was amazing because, I mean, God is not requiring you to do extraordinary things. But the simple things that you do, the joy you express in your life is going to convince a lot of people that that is the truth. It must be the truth because it transformed you from a, a grumpy person to this happy person, mm -hmm. right? And you know, I think that this ties in perfectly with the um, sentence under the note where it says, the scripture is a panacea for trouble, disappointment, mm -hmm. and affliction. And the word panacea actually it means a solution or remedy for all difficulties, and it's like a cure-all. So basically, the scriptures, it's like a cure-all for everything. And that's why when you see, like you were, exactly what you were mentioning, when you see people mm -hmm. who have faith, like you can see the transformation in their life. Maybe they were depressed or sad or, you know, they had a very unpleasant demeanor. And then after coming to Christ, it's like everything about them changed. They were mm -hmm. so much happier. Mm -hmm. Different than might be expected. What principle given by Jesus is a secret to a happier life? It's happier, it's better, it's more positive to do what? To give. To give. Wow. Isn't that strange? <laughs> because we, we are born with this tendency of asking, requiring, being happy when we receive, right? Mm -hmm. And the more we receive, like you said, you want more, right? Mm -hmm. 
the more you want. And actually, the, the remedy for a happy life is rather to give mm -hmm. than to receive. Yeah. There's a sentence in the Desire of Ages that says, to give is to live. Mm -hmm. And it's a short, but it's powerful. Mm -hmm. It means that giving will literally give you life. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of life is, is this helping you experience when you give? Is it a life of want? Is it a life of sadness because you gave, because you had to give? You know, just watch a, a child's face when he receives and watch the same face when he or she has to give, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's different. So what kind of life do we have by giving? Well, I, you know, to me what summarizes this in the best way is um, the, I think it's the second sentence in the last paragraph of the note under 2a. It says, he that gives to the needy blesses others and is blessed himself in still mm. a greater degree. Wow. So mm -hmm. to me, when we live to give to others, we walk away more blessed mm -hmm. than maybe the person we just helped. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. this is, it perfectly describes what, uh, you know, a life of service is. Yeah. And with what appeal does the Lord bid us align our priorities in life? Mm -hmm. well, it's the same verse that we, it's a theme, it's <laughs> we a keep, theme. We, we, we keep using the same verse for so <laughs> many applications, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where your heart is, where your treasure is, is also your heart, right? Mm -hmm. A basic requirement for Tuesday. What must every one of us keep in mind in the process of genuine self-denying surrender to Christ in preparation for the kingdom of heaven? Hmm? How do you understand this word? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Mm. Um, this is like a protest against self. That, that was the life Paul was living, right? In order for him to be able to offer for the rejoicing of others, he had to deny himself, right? So it was, it was either him or others happy, mm -hmm. right? And it's amazing. Um, and this, I would encourage people to try this. You know, when, when God says, try me and you will see, I will open the gates of heaven, the windows of heaven, and I will give you blessings. Even, even if you do not do it naturally, wholeheartedly put God to test hmm. you know see how he is going to multiply I know it says that God is going to bless the the joyful um, giver right mm -hmm. but I believe that when God says try me he is also appealing to those who do not naturally give Mm -hmm. who do not understand that by giving you also, you, you are actually receiving even more, right? So God says, try me, you know, in spite of ourselves, in spite of our tendency, in spite of our natural inclination, do something opposite, different than what you feel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do something different, put God to test, and you will see the blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it says the basic requirement and the phrase, I die daily, that's an action, right? Mm -hmm. You have to constantly do something. And, you know, an inspiration tells us that the Christian life is a battle and a march. It's not a walk in the park. It's not as soon as you're baptized. That's it. You've done everything. Every day is a constant struggle. It says, mm -hmm. it uses the word engage. Every day we have to engage. We have to engage in this warfare for ourselves. Like, I can't save you. I can't save mm -hmm. you. It's the battle for yourself. You have to do your part to die so that you may live. Mm -hmm. Be proactive, mm -hmm. not reactive, mm -hmm. right? Not only reacting to circumstances, but actually create your own circumstances, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This is what gives joy to life and satisfaction. Not only be there and whenever you feel 
like circumstances dictate you to act, then you act. No, create your own circumstances. Mm -hmm. Th this is what I always encourage young people to do. Take control of your life. Mm -hmm. Don't just react to what others are giving you, right? Mm -hmm. Don't don't just, don't be passive, be active. And then when you do that, you are going to surprise your worst enemies, even Satan, right? Mm -hmm. Because what Satan wants is for us to sit back and relax. And mm -hmm. he is going to give us. And, and usually when we react instead of pro-react, right? When we do not take the initiative, we, we get to the point of doing wrong things, mm -hmm. even against ourselves, just because we are reacting. And when you are reacting out of an impulse of a moment, mm -hmm. you are going to damage others and damage yourself. Mm -hmm. So take control of life rather than be controlled mm -hmm. by it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Wednesday, a good habit from a young age. How does the concept of self-denial apply even to children and youth? And we mentioned children a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the verse says, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. I mean, even as a kid, you always have that one kid your mom tells you, don't, don't be around <laughs> them. And, you know, it, it's not to say that your parents have ill intentions or they want to be rude to the other child. It's just that you, even a child displays their characteristics and who they are. And, you know, especially as parents, I'm sure they can understand, you know, you don't want your, your child to also fall under the same influence. And, you know, even with my nephew, when, you know, you mentioned uh, their face when you give them something versus when yeah. you take it away. <laughs> oh, boy. And especially if they have a temper, it's totally different. And, you know, even as the note says, children two to four years of age should not be encouraged to think that they must have everything that they ask for. Parents should teach them lessons of self-denial and never treat them in such a way as to make them think that they are the center and that everything revolves around them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think the, the note also, you know, talks about, you know, self-denial and how um, our youth have to be taught, you know, how to spend their money and to be responsible with it. But you can see when a child is, is brought up to think that they can have anything they want with that entitlement, you know, it, it carries on through their entire adult life versus when their, you know, parents raise them in a, you know, godly Christian way. They learn self-denial from their earliest age. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, this is this can be applied to everybody, you know, even the youngest. It mentions the, the age is two to four, and you think that's so young. Mm -hmm. But I was reading the story of, and I don't I don't know this family, but there's this couple that was at church and they gave their daughter a quarter and they're like, when the offering comes, put it in the basket. So the offering come, it came and she had the quarter in her fist and they're like, put it in and she did not, she was like, no. Mm. Like she knew that that was money and that had value and she was like, no. And like their parents are so embarrassed, like put it in. And like people are looking and like, what's going on? And finally, the only way she put it is because they like literally like opened her <laughs> hand and Boy. like she put the coin in and she was not happy about it and the parents mm. were so embarrassed. And afterward, like a couple of days later, the mom is like watching her daughter. She's on a swing and she's like swinging. And every time she got up to the sky, she's like, God, I want my quarterback. And then she would swing back and she'd go, God, I want my quarterback. And like, so she knew that the money had value and she wanted it. And her, her mother was like, wow, like I cannot believe that she has this mentality that like she does not want to give. Yeah. And, you know, I laugh and I think the story is funny, but how, how many of us are the same way where we give, but we're like, oh, we either want a reward like we talked about mm -hmm. or like we don't want to give that much. Or So I thought that was interesting from like a four-year-old new. Oh, yeah. You know, and even Augustine, he writes about how, you know, even children have like tendencies, you know, to, to act this way or, yeah. you know, because of sin. Yeah. yeah. I, I used to be the child that parents didn't want their children to have <laughs> around, you know. And uh, I was six years old when I first thought I needed a change. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. You know, I knew already at, at the age of six that yeah. I was evil, you know. Mm. Uh, well, because of the way others were telling me, you know, I, why are you not like the others, you know. Mm. Like uh, my grandparents were happy when, the, when their um, grandchildren were 
coming over for vacation but when you know they were happy until they heard I was going you know? oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 it would change completely you know oh he is coming man. <laughs> and by the way yeah my my uncles would not want their children to be there when when I was your own family you know, I was a bad oh, man, influence yeah. anyway uh, give an example of how early training in economy was put into place. The verse is very short, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what this is saying is that uh, we th there is a power of example in the world, right? Mm -hmm. We look up to people. So when Paul says, "Follow me," um, he knows what he means, right? Mm -hmm. Because I mean, in, in Romanian we have a saying, right? before you get to God, you, you get to know the saints, mm -hmm. right? And the way we behave is going to have an influence on whether others believe in God or not. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. So the, the question is, give an example of how early training in economy was put into practice. And we, we have many examples, like, mm -hmm. like uh, we, we were just mentioning uh, uh, last Sabbath, Timothy, mm. how he, differently from others who are living for themselves, Paul says, but you know the proof of him who as a child with his father worked with me in the gospel, right? Mm. There was an exception, you know, of a young person. Uh, but we have in, in the life of the early pioneers, Adventist pioneers, examples of how they were earning how much per day? 25 cents a day. Mm. Are you sure? It wasn't $2,500, no. <laughs> no, it was 25 cents. And mm -hmm. what did they want to make sure they would use that money for? For the missions. Hmm. Yeah. So they got to the point of having how much? $30. And when they heard about mission trips and uh, tracks being spread and people accepting the truth and the preaching of the message of Christ's second return, they said, we want to be part of this. Mm -hmm. How can we be part of this? We don't know much. We don't have much, but what we have, we will give. And not only that, they it says that they felt it a privilege. That's like mm -hmm. a beautiful word, a privilege to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, whenever I give offering, do I consider that a privilege to help mm -hmm. others? And it's inspiring that even though they had so little, they still felt it a privilege to, to help in any way they could. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful lesson to learn from. The good example, like it said. Yeah. And it's uh, what I like about this story is that they were encouraging one another. It was mm -hmm. only one person doing it, but they were encouraging uh, one another. And mm -hmm. oh, look at this! Look at what we can mm -hmm. do! What a difference we can make! You know, how much did you earn today? Twenty-five cents. Mm. Oh, that's good. Let, you know, let, let's keep uh, five for ourselves and keep twenty for the missions. Mm. You know, and then they have thirty dollars. Who knows how much you could have bought for the thirty dollars? Oh, yeah. And uh, you say, oh, wait a minute. How much did we work for this money? Mm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, so that was over a hundred days of work. Mm. And it says that they were only 12 years old. Yeah. That really shows that, you know, that to develop a good habit from a young age. Yeah, this is when um, parents come in, because they say they gave the money to the father, which means mm -hmm. the father was involved in the work, right? Mm -hmm. And they were hearing the stories about how these people were giving their hearts to Jesus. They said, we want to be part of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the atmosphere in the family is very important. And we come to the last day of in our studies, Thursday, continuing as we age. Just as the young should lay up treasures in heaven, how also should the older ones? Uh, and we have again psalms, songs, right? Man, I, I wish I could have a melody to this uh, you know, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of his people. Mm. And 
this is a, you know, we would call this a strange verse, right? Because it says it's unusual. Precious in, is in, in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. Uh, I believe God is happy because of the way his saints die, mm -hmm. right? They, God is happy because of the way we age. Mm -hmm. If we age, this considering God's grace, God is not happy. That's why he says in the death of his saints, right? Because when you die in, you know, in, in good communion with the Lord, all you possess, you are going to give, right? Um, we were talking about will, about how we invest our money while we are still alive, right? Um, advancing in age, having the wisdom, having the experience, you know, it's. Um, I, I like the verse in First John two fourteen. The same Bible verse is writing to both young people and elderly, and it says, "I have written unto you, parents, because you have known God. I have written unto you, young people, because you are strong." Right? Same Bible verse to generations. You know, we, we live in a time when there, where there is a lot of segregation, right? By age, by race, by this, by that, right? God wants us to learn from one another. Mm -hmm. And so as children, right? We, we, talk, uh, we, we talked about children, how they have to be altruistic, how they have to invest, they, how to learn to sacrifice. How about the elderly? Uh, it's, it's just amazing, you know. In Luke chapter 12, he says, Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fail not. You know, we, we can't help but mention the fact that when you advance in age, you have to be very calculated with the way you use your means, um, financial means, your time, because your time is short, right? Mm -hmm. And then we come to the conclusion that God is happy when people die as his saints, right? That's what I believe this, this Bible verse is trying to say, because it, it seems to say that, oh, God is so happy when some people die, right? Mm -hmm. Some of his, no, what the Bible verse says, you know, God is happy when people die as his children rather than still not in, um, in harmony with God. So God is happy when people die in harmony with him, mm -hmm. right? It reminds me of, I think it was Paul who said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course and I have kept the faith. Exactly. And fourth there is laid up a crown for me of righteousness. So mm. when if we're able to say that, like have lived a good life and able to say that, I feel like the Lord will, mm. that's what he the He says, a crown is awaiting. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And I think it's, you know, important that pretty much to each person, at every point in life it says, uh, to each is assigned a post to duty, not for his own narrow selfish interests, but that the influence of each may strengthen to all. If we really believe that we are individually a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men, would we not as a church manifest a very different spirit from that which we now manifest? Would we not be, live, be a living, working church? So, you know, I think that as it, mm -hmm. it goes from the individual to the church and how all together we have to all be thinking about, you know, how are we using, you know, as stewards, pretty much because this is stewards in the last days, how are we as a church, you know, Christ stewards, how are we using 
the things that he's entrusted to us. And, mm -hmm. you know, that every person, like, you know, the part of the body, you know, it says Christ's body, every member of the church, every steward has a part to play. Mm -hmm. And if we all realized our value and our importance mm -hmm. and our part, you know, then we'd be a living and a working church, like it says here in the known. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it also says the, that the influence of each will be a strength. Mm -hmm. So that's how we would become a living church. Mm -hmm. There is one Bible verse that I would like, I would have liked to be included in the lesson. And because it wasn't, I will mention it. And that is Philippians 1.21. Mm -hmm. Can one of you read it? Philippians 1.21 says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Mm -hmm. So that's kind the kind of death that God is rejoicing in. Mm -hmm. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And then he continues saying, if I don't die, it's for you, not for me. It's for your sake, not for me. In other words, if Paul lived, he would suffer, but you know, it was for the benefit of the church. If he died, it didn't matter for him. Because as long as for you to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you die without living in Christ, it's a loss. Because you resurrect for eternal death, not for everlasting life. But if for you to live is Christ, which means... You know, you, you live for Christ, you live for others, you serve others, you invest your properties, you invest your money, uh, your time in, in heaven. That's what death is going to be for you, right? Death is going to be a gain because the next moment you will be conscious of, you will be in the presence of God, right? So isn't this amazing? Is it worth investing in heaven? Is it worth having our treasure saved in heaven? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, um, you are young. Um, I think it's not too early to start thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because the more we invest, the more lives we save. The, er the sooner we start, the farther we are going to get in our experience with the Lord. I, I gave my heart to God when I was 18. And, uh, you know, some people said, oh, you are so young. Why, why would you do it now? Well, I'm sorry I didn't do it sooner. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I didn't do it when I was six years old, when I first felt the need of a change. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have the, the, the necessary uh, support that I needed. So it, it took God a long time to convince me to give my heart to him. Mm -hmm. So the earlier, the better. And to those watching, I want to encourage you from the bottom of my heart to invest in heaven, to build your treasures, to save your treasures, um, and invest them into saving souls, because that's going to give us joy, extreme joy in heaven, seeing that souls were saved because of your investment. I invite you to pray so that God will bestow his blessings upon us. Our Father, we chart in heaven, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege to be serving you in this life and for the privilege to seeing so many people give their hearts to you. We pray that we may learn to invest in heaven, to invest in your kingdom, to invest in eternal life, not only for us, but for those around us. May we be joyous in giving. May we express our gratitude to you. May we live happy lives, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Adrian, and thank you for joining us as we study the lesson, Treasures in Heaven. Join us again next week as we cover our next lesson, The Tithe and First Fruits.